Ladies, gents, how's it going? Random Gary here once again. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Gary Pratt. Um, I served 12 years in the British Army. I received um, one of Britain's highest awards for gallantry. So I've been looking over a few um, uh, stories that have significant examples of gallantry within them, trying to talk through some of my experiences, um, relating them to those of the recipients in these and, and seeing where the kind of stories may hold some secrets that, that I might have some access to. Today we're looking at the medic who fought a war without a weapon, the legendary Desmond Doss. Let's see where this goes. Wish us luck. The medic who fought a war without a weapon. Desmond Doss was not your average hero. He would become a Medal of Honor recipient, the United States of America's highest and most prestigious military award, as a combat medic who saved many of his comrades' lives in battle without firing a single shot, because he didn't take a weapon into combat because of his religious beliefs. Desmond Doss was born in 1919 in the state of Virginia and was raised as a strict Seventh-day Adventist, a Christian denomination that believed that Saturday was the Sabbath and that the second coming of Jesus Christ was imminent. They also believe strongly in nonviolence and a healthy diet, based typically on a vegetarian diet. Doss had been raised with a strict belief in the Bible, and when it came to the Ten Commandments, he took them to be the core values of how to lead his life. When World War II started, he was conflicted as he believed the war was a just one, but he felt that to kill another human being under any circumstance was wrong. He was already employed as a joiner at Newport News Naval Shipyard, but nevertheless, he joined the United States Army on April 1st, 1942. He could have requested a deferment, but he wanted to do his patriotic duty. He was assigned to an infantry unit, the 77th Division, and presumed that his classification as a conscientious objector would not require him to carry a weapon. For Doss, one commandment of the Bible stuck with him the most, thou shalt not kill. He wondered why he was assigned as a rifleman and not in a medical role. His commanding officer tried to pressure Doss into carrying a weapon as they thought he would be more of a liability than an asset in combat, but Doss refused. Interestingly, even for medics, which Doss would later become, it was common practice at the time to carry either an M1911A1 pistol or M1 carbine for self-defense purposes. The rules go that a medic under the Geneva Convention is not forbidden from carrying a weapon, but if a medic fires his weapon, he stops being classed as a medic, and therefore can be legitimately fired upon by the enemy. The regimental chaplain, Captain Stanley, would soon understand Doss's protests and helped him transfer from rifleman to medical training. Yeah, I think this is fantastic. You can be a conscientious objector, but you can still do your role. Um, there's been a number of people who have, who have done this here kind of thing recently, and they've they've tried to make headlines for themselves. Well, what Doss did is 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 superb. If if you don't like the fight, you just find a job where you you don't have to fight. Um, one of the ones in in the UK was a flipping chef, and he turned around and said, "I'm a conscientious objector. I I." You take more lives with your flipping lack of cooking than you do with your rifles. To make matters worse, his fellow soldiers mocked his religious beliefs. When he was reading the Bible daily and strictly observing true. the Seventh-day Adventist tradition of attending church every Saturday, Doss continuously requested to be allowed to have Saturdays off, rather than Sundays, in order to follow his Adventist beliefs that Saturday was to be observed as the Sabbath. In the end, Captain Stanley took this up with divisional headquarters, and it was decided that Aventus soldiers would have Saturdays off, just as the other men had Sunday nice. off. This in fact made Doss even more unpopular than ever with his fellow soldiers, as he was seen to have it easy. As he had Saturdays off, none were on base on Sundays to see him pull extra duties to make up for this. One of the squad's other soldiers summed up the company's feeling about him and his Saturdays off, complaining. You get more passes than the general. As Doss was a strict vegetarian at a time when it was unusual, it meant that the rest of the unit viewed Doss with such distrust and hostility that one man in his unit even warned him ominously. When we go into combat, Doss, you're not coming back alive. I'm going to shoot you myself. Doss eventually became an army combat medic, saying, While others are taking life, I will be saving it. The turning point for Doss and his relationship with his company came with their first 25-mile march 
with full field pack and rifle, something they were expected to achieve in eight hours. The other soldiers thought Doss would be having it easy as he would be carrying no rifle or ammo that day, but his two canvas medical bags were almost as heavy and much more awkward to carry than any rifle. As the march progressed, the men started to suffer from exhaustion, numerous blistered feet and dehydration, some even passed out. And all the time there was Doss, always with a helping hand, even to the extent that at the end of the march, he insisted on checking everyone's feet and administering medical aid where it was needed. By the end of that day, he had won the respect of his entire unit for his tireless devotion to his duty. For the first time, he was treated as one of their own. Doss, as the qualified combat medic of the unit, was now responsible for providing first aid and frontline trauma care on the battlefield. He would be assigned to accompany his unit into the war zone and be there with them on the front line at all times. This was soon to happen, for the 77th Division had had their first combat experience on May 11, 1943, and Doss and his comrades were urgently being trained up to replace the combat losses and help expand the division's strength the 77th Division would end up being in combat officially for no less than 208 days, suffering a total of 9,212 casualties before the war would end. The Battle of Guam Doss's first taste of combat was at the Battle of Guam, which was a bloody battle fought from July 21st to August 10th, 1944, to recapture the U.S. territory of the island of Guam from a determined Japanese garrison of nearly 20,000 troops. Though according to the Geneva Convention, knowingly firing at a medic wearing a clear insignia is a I don't think there was, there was much notice of the Geneva Convention. Was there even a Geneva Convention in the Second World War? Let me just have a look. Geneva Convention. 1949. Yeah, Geneva Convention. Usually the notes the agreements of 1949 negotiated in the aftermath of the Second World War. I know there was treaties and everything after the First World War, but I didn't think it was classed as the Geneva Convention. Okay. War crime, the Japanese snipers and machine gunners tended to ignore this and saw combat medics as easy and valuable targets to gun down. So medics in the Pacific theater were often told to that. avoid wearing medical insignia in case it would make them more, not less, of a target. Doss was under fire nearly every day during the battle and was busy doing his part in saving lives. Guam had shown Doss how cruel war could be. Now, we, we as in the, the British military, we're, we're quite aware of the, the kind of Pacific, um, the, the battles that went on there. What's, what's it like in the States? Because I've, I've heard it often referred to as the Forgotten War, the Forgotten Front from the Second World War, and quite often whenever everybody was celebrating, uh, victory in Europe, um, there was this real kind of awareness from everybody who had been out in Asia fighting uh, that the, the war was extremely far from over. What's, what's, what's your thoughts? How's it seen? As his unit was pushing forward through the jungle on their first day, a young, fresh-faced recruit spotted a fountain pen laying on the jungle floor and went to pick it up. Before anyone could warn him otherwise, this is um, one that's still used this day. In fact, the IRA, I'm sure, in the, the 90s, they threw a torch over a, a, a military um, camp um, perimeter. And a young, uh, a young guy from the, the Army Cadets, which is like the, the kids who are, you know, uh, just getting into kind of military stuff. You know, they do a bit of shooting, a bit of marching, all of that kind of stuff. He actually found this torch. He picked it up. He switched it on. And uh, if if I remember rightly, it, it blinded him. Uh, yeah, that was that's a, a big big flash from the past. So it was always this thing of if you see anything shiny on the ground, don't pick it up, don't touch it. It's likely to be a bit of a crap. A white phosphorus grenade exploded. The pen had been booby trapped. The young man who had picked up the pen, his chest now a bloody mess, had blood pouring out of an open wound. Severe burns and sharp metal fragments covered his body, 
and he was going into shock. By some miracle, Doss managed to stabilize his condition, administering care and helping to evacuate him and three other soldiers who had been wounded by flying red-hot shrapnel. This Boss was Doss's first taste of combat casualties. The U.S. casualties during the battle was truly appalling. Of the 59,000 U.S. troops who took part in the invasion, around every one in six were either killed or wounded. The Battle of Leyte Next, Doss and his unit was involved in the Battle of Leyte in the Philippines that ran from October 17th to December 26, 1944. A vicious and prolonged battle which started with a huge U.S. coastal bombardment and amphibious landing followed by heavy fighting the more inland the Americans went. Yeah, unopposed, wasn't it? During a Japanese counterattack, a fellow medic, Clarence Glenn, had heard the call for a medic from a machine gunner. He left the cover and went into the open, into no man's land, to get the Ooh. wounded man and was himself hit. Glenn was Doss's friend from back home and he couldn't leave him there. So he and a litter bearer, Herb Schechter, went out to find the two wounded and- A litter bearer? Oh, is that what that said? A litter bearer? Heard of a stretcher bear, not a lit litter bear. Hit. Glenn was Doss's friend from back home and he couldn't leave him there. So he and a litter bearer, Herb Schechter, went out to find the two wounded they and dealt with them separately. Doss was attending the machine gunner who had a gash along his face while bullets whizzed overhead. Both of the wounded were alive. They made an improvised litter out of a poncho and tree branches to get the wounded men back to the aid station. But his friend Glenn... It's a stretcher. Must be a stretcher bearer. Must be. Would die before he made it. From this point on, Doss would not look at the face of the men he was treating in case it was another friend. Sadly, his friend Herb would be shot and killed when he and Doss were carrying a litter as their silhouette exposed them against the sky to the enemy. On top of losing his friends, Doss was constantly hungry because the meat in the K rations conflicted with his vegetarianism, so he could only eat the tasteless crackers and coconuts he found. A lady, the coconuts on the ground gave him diarrhea, so he climbed the trees for fresh ones. At one point, Doss was looking for coconuts. It attracted poorly aimed Japanese machine gun fire. When they were killed by American soldiers, it was later discovered that they had been drunk on sake. One thing that shocked Doss during the most devastating times of the campaign was that the same man who had made threats towards him during training at Fort Jackson now came to him for guidance and to pray for him. The Battle of Okinawa. And lastly, for Doss and the 77th the Infantry one. Division, was a battle that was to be the bloodiest battle of the war in the Pacific, as well as its largest amphibious landing. The U.S. objective was to secure the island as a base, as it was just 350 miles south of the Japanese mainland, and would be strategically crucial for any future invasion of Japan. The battle started on April 1st, 1945, exactly three years to the day that Doss first enlisted in the army, and the battle was to last 81 days. Doss was assigned to the 1st Battalion as their combat medic. On April 29, 1945, the 77th Division was given the task of assaulting on a 400-foot-high cliff called the Maida Escarpment. 400-foot? Uh, they're underselling it in this picture. I've, I, I, I've been to Ponte Hoc a couple of times, and quite how the, the Rangers managed to make that, that kind of cliff assault work. I will never know. There's so many back angles, so many reverse reverse shots for the enemy to get. Uh, by and large, the naval bombardment, the air bombardment, was ineffective because the, the German bunkers were so good. Um, any damage that you see at Pont de Hoc um, bunkers was due to um, experiments with explosives afterwards to see what it would actually take to destroy the bunkers. By and large, I, I understand that the... The um, bunkers were were pretty pretty safe and pretty secure. This I don't understand. I I used to be a bit of a mountaineer. I used to do a lot of rock climbing. I have no idea how you can tactically climb a rock face and still make an assault work at the same time. It is just yeah. Either they didn't know what they were doing, or as in how dangerous it was going to be, or they were flipping. Better man than me. This was nicknamed by the Americans as Hacksaw Ridge. Before they climbed the cargo net, Doss said a prayer for his comrades. 
when Dos's unit joined the assault, and as they neared the top of the escarpment, they came under intense Japanese artillery, small arms, and machine gun fire, inflicting severe casualties on the assaulting American troops. The American forces had sent in wave after wave of troops to try to dislodge a fanatical enemy base there, who were well entrenched and camouflaged. On May 4th, while his unit was attacking a heavily fortified enemy position at the mouth of a cave, Doss went to the aid of four of his injured comrades. The lieutenant who led the attack on the emplacement had intended to throw a grenade when an enemy bullet hit him and delayed it, blowing his hand off and wounding his comrades. Despite having to get within 25 feet of the enemy lines and under attack by enemy grenades at gunfire, Doss managed to get to the injured men. He then managed to evacuate the men back to his own lines, one by one. During the night, the Japanese continued to throw grenades and kept up the mortar fire. The American soldiers hid in rock crevices, but the Japanese found ways to infiltrate and sneak up on them. Then on the next day, May 5th, he came to the rescue of a wounded artillery officer who had gone to see how the artillery guns were doing. Doss's left leg was now injured as he had fell the day before down the edge of a parapet. He climbed up the cargo net with his first aid kits, his weight falling on his bad leg. Finding him in a shell hole, the officer had been struck by shrapnel that had made a hole from his chest to his back, and Doss could hear him breathing through it. He was bleeding heavily. Doss gave him first aid while under constant enemy gunfire and shelling. He put the dressings over the large holes in the colonel's chest and back, and administered blood plasma which dangerously exposed Doss to the enemy as he had to hold it up high. <laughs> Doss's efforts here would be in vain, as the colonel carried back on a stretcher died before he re- I think they're in glass kind of uh, bottles. At, the, at that point, I don't think I, there was the, the kind of ability to squeeze it to get it in. Therefore, you have to hold it, you have to use gravity, and you're completely exposed to the yourself. aid station. Later, there were orders to take a vital Japanese pillbox position on the reverse slope of a hill that was holding up the American advance. Desmond Doss, once he had read his prayers, was happy to support the assault. The American troops threw gasoline cans at the position, which triggered a large explosion. All of a sudden, a large Japanese counterattack overwhelmed the American soldiers, causing them to panic and rush back to the edge of the cliff. But despite this, Doss refused to take cover, and while constantly under heavy fire by the enemy, Though being totally exhausted, he spent hours carrying the wounded one by one to the edge of the escarpment. I think we've all seen the film, but you just cannot imagine the reality of that situation, having that many um, enemy forces, that many friendly forces injured and killed. It's it, it's just something that um, it will be kind of left in history. You just cannot capture what that must have been like, no matter how big a budget you have. Then, to get the more severely wounded down, he tied a rope to a tree stump and lowered them down the cliff on a rope-supported stretcher to safety. When the stretcher kept slipping, he turned to a new method, looping the rope around the wounded men's chest and legs to lower them down. Doss, standing, exposed to potential enemy fire, was seen praying at the cliff edge as the men were being lowered down. And later, he had said he had been praying to the Lord to help him get one more, and after that, one more, until they were all down. Calculating the wounded men at the base of the cliff, the captain worked out that Doss had saved around 75 men. The Americans would eventually go back up the cliff and on May 7th would take the position. By some miracle, Doss survived the whole battle totally unhurt, but that was soon to change. On May 21st, in the confusion of a night attack, Doss tended to the American wounded, risking being hit by both the Japanese and by friendly fire. Doss was in a shell hole with another American soldier when a grenade landed beneath him. His reflex action was to put his foot on it and was seriously wounded in both legs, as blood poured out from the impact of 17 pieces of shrapnel in his body. But he remained in his position for five hours, tending to himself while also helping others who were wounded, until a medic and a pair of litter bearers could get to him. But that was not the end of it that day, for as he was being stretchered to safety, they got caught in an enemy tank attack. As they took cover, Doss spotted a critically injured man and insisted that he be taken back on the stretcher instead of himself. While Doss waited for the litter bearers to return, he was found and helped back by a fellow soldier. 
Suddenly, Doss was hit by a Japanese sniper's bullet and suffered a compound fracture to his arm. The two men took cover in a shell hole. Realizing how badly injured he now was, Doss instructed the soldier on how to bind his rifle stock to his shattered arm to act as a splint. Eventually, pushing through excruciating pain, he would make Whoa. it back to the aid station. Horrible. The U.S. Army recognized Doss's extreme bravery, and he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his heroic and... So, so here's another question for you guys. So I've, I've heard of it. I've, I always thought it was the Medal of Honor. I've heard people referring it to as being the Congressional Medal of Honor. I thought it was because it was awarded by Congress. I didn't believe it was the Congressional Medal of Honor. What's, what's the truth? What's the legit story on it? Selfless actions at Okinawa from April 29th to May 21st, 1945. Because of his heroic actions, many wounded men made it back home. Desmond Doss would go on to run a small family farm with his wife, Dorothy, and lived to the age of 87. That's all he wanted, isn't it? What an absolute legend. Um, please bang up uh, thumbs up if you, you like what you see and hit the subscribe button. We are approaching 800 subscribers. I might need to start thinking about a giveaway for a thousand. Um, yeah, please let me know if you've got any ideas of what I could give away. Hope to see you all again very soon. Have a good one. See you later.